Hi, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. On this episode, I'm delighted to be talking with someone whose work I've admired for some time, and that is artist, author, Dean Haspiel. Dean, thank you for jumping in and joining. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me on. It is a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I, of course, know you for working on Red Hook, as well as The Fox and a variety of other works that I've seen over the years. But we have many books to talk about because you have uh, sort of the the deep cut editions of some of your work <laughs> as well. I yeah. think that's what it says at the bottom of the page, right? The I, didn't, I didn't know what to call it, like Dean Haspiel Universe, Dean Haspiel, you know, deep cuts is also like a jazz term, I believe. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. do feel like I'm kind of freestyling here. So uh, I've launched my fourth Kickstarter. And I feel like the the comics, you know, maybe the comics are somewhat, somewhat similar in my sensibility, right? Mm -hmm. But they're different enough from each other that I feel like it's not like a series that I'm publishing, but it's more like albums. You know, I, I Prince, Prince was my favorite, you know, musician and singer and artist, you know, in that way. But yeah, he put out an album and, you know, like 1999 is different from Purple Rain. It's different from, you know, Around the World of the Day and Sign of the Times and Love Sexy and so on and so forth. The Black Album, which was like a bootleg album that fell off the truck, you know, mm -hmm. uh, supposedly. But uh, I kind of try to see my work, my personal work as being like albums, you know, but through comics. Uh, but they do share, like, you know, it's you know it's Prince, and hopefully I have now created some sensibility that you know it's Dean, you know, if, yeah. if you know my work. So I definitely think so. I think so. And uh, that kind of album approach, I imagine that allows you some freedom, some flexibility to go in different directions, to challenge yourself, to have work that reflects, like, a different period, maybe? Uh, definitely. Freedom, definitely, right? Because when you're self-publishing, you know, do I need an editor? Probably, you know, like, but my friends are my editors sometimes. Like like Whitney Matheson, who's my studio mate, definitely my recent works, has an eyeball on everything. Uh, Josh Neufeld, an old pal of mine who also makes comics, you know, helps design my my, my books, you know, and, and gets it to the printer because I don't know how to do anything. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, in terms of like, what I'm trying to express, I don't know. That's what keeps it interesting. Like, I, I feel like they're different enough between the Red Hook or COVID Cop or Billy Dogman and Jane Legit or now Chess Face. Mm -hmm. You know, it's me trying to like reinvent how to have fun at the yard table again, you know, every time. Because, you know, once you figure out the story, and, and the way I work is I'll write the story out like a script, right? Like I'm writing for the artist, although I am the artist. Okay, whatever. But then, like, I got to lay it out. So I'm, I'm handing the narrative baton over to the other side of myself. Then I would need to visualize this, okay? And then, actually, that's kind of where comics, that's where it happens, right there in the layouts, okay? Yeah. And so I have script. I, I figure out how to use the page. And now I got to draw the damn thing. I got to <laughs> really draw it. So then I got to sit and figure it out. And that's where you, podcasts like yours and music and conversations or whatever helps me sit with that page for six to eight hours, sometimes 10 hours, depending, you know, uh, I use a blue pencil uh, so that I don't need to erase it after I ink it. But there's a lot of erasing happening in the blue pencil stage for some reason these days. I don't know, the older I get, right? The harder it becomes. I don't know. I thought it would get easier. But um, I don't know. I, I, I'm i just trying to explore stuff. I, I try to tell myself I'm hopefully making something you didn't know you wanted. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And hopefully if you were to pick it up, up you, you would stick with it. You know, you the cover draws you in. OK, what is this first page? All right. That's cool. I want to know more, you know, and yet at the end of the day, I'm not like trying to like do any voodoo. I'm not like trying to overtly manipulate you, but I am trying to entertain you while pulling you in to maybe tell you a story that maybe you haven't really seen before. Mm -hmm. But I would acknowledge that all my comics are absolutely influenced by the comics I grew up reading, you know, oh. uh, and also whatever I'm into, right, you know, today to keep it fresh. So I don't know. I, that's kind of the sensibility thing that I think about, you know. Yeah. Are there um, current titles or there are artists that you're checking out lately? Speaking of keeping it fresh and exploring what's out there. All the all the alternative stuff, man. Like as much as I love a Marvel and DC comic, my Marvel and DC comics probably actually kind of ends with the first Secret Wars, 
Yeah. So we're talking about maybe the first 25 years of Marvel, a bunch of DC comics. Actually, DC for me got a little more interesting with like, I don't know, Watchmen, Dark Knight, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I was more a Marvel guy, you know, like Marvel 2 and 1, the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, you know, all that stuff. And DC had its Batman and Green Lantern. I wasn't really much of a Superman fan. I don't understand Superman. He's hard to get for me. I, he's yeah. very easy to understand. But in the creative mind, I have a hard time thinking of a Superman story that hasn't yeah. been done, you know? So, um, and, and I drew a Superman comic two years ago for DC written by Cena Grace. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just, you know, honoring what Cena had written, you know, with, with, the, with the pictures. Um, but yeah, in terms of new people, there's this guy named Mati Keen. Do you know Mati Keen? I don't, I don't. He I created don't something called that. the Superverse. That's, it's like Superverse, but Superverse. Okay. Oh, nice. Uh, and he has a bunch of great comics, and, and I'll turn you on to him. He's really cool. Uh, a guy named Nicholas Forker, Nick Forker, uh -huh. who does uh -huh. Island, and he's actually down the hall from me now. He just moved to the, our studio building. Uh, gosh, I don't know. Some of my older buddies, like I'm trying to think of current Kickstarters, like Dan Goldman has mm -hmm. a Kickstarter right now, uh, who uses a lot of, uh, you know, uh, his Photoshop skills are very uh brilliant like he that's another thing i i write and draw on paper i scan it in so i'm still old school right mm -hmm. uh and then i try to figure out to do some kind of limited color palette on my work and do the lettering uh in photoshop but some of these kids today man they're just on their ipads or their phones and they're just mm -hmm. cranking this stuff out and some of it looks like it's just being cranked out which is fair because in a lot of ways comics it shouldn't be stopping you to ogle the art. It should be moving the story along, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I And yet I've done a ton of web comics too, right? So if you can't beat them, join them type thing, right? And, I, and I've been thinking about doing web comics since 2005. Nice, uh, and I launched yeah. something called Activate in 2006 for a few years, where I, I really went whole hog, you know? I was working on some graphic novels that would take a year or so to draw. So they're behind the scenes. Nobody sees this stuff. And then you hope for when it finally comes out that it, but usually the case is you get a couple of weeks of some kind of, you know, promotion and then that's it. And if it didn't blow up onto the next, right. Mm -hmm. But what's cool about doing a weekly web comic back then was that I was still present and online, you know, and I was actually building out a whole other graphic novel while concurrently drawing the one I was getting paid for, you know? So that's a lot of a lot of this stuff was born from that kind of necessity of you know being out there and not disappearing, kind of a thing. Yeah. You mentioned the the color palettes that you use, which is in addition to your art style. That's one of the things I picked up on uh, looking back through uh, Billy Dogma, looking through Chess Face, and the, the pages that you shared with me. Uh, any any direction that goes in, any inspirations that go into the way that you select what the page is going to look like to have them? It really is, it, it comes from my frustration of not knowing how to use four colors, you know, the four <laughs> color spectrum as it were. Like, I have a difficult time. When I see it done, it's brilliant. And in fact, I think some of the better colorists don't use all four colors at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. they, they limit something, you know, but it's still fully realized, you know, and it's spectacular. Some of this stuff is amazing. I don't know how to do that. I can't figure it out. So I use color as a shading tone. You know, like I like the color white. You know, I like a good black and white comic, you know. Um, and then what I tend to do is I'll do like a shade on it to give it some more volume or whatever, uh, more value. And then the minute I add like another color is when I start, it starts to get a little messy for me. So I need to figure that out sometimes. So I try to limit it to two colors or just keep it one shade and maybe another darker version of that shade. And that's 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 what I'm thinking when I do it. And I feel more comfortable with that. So I'm actually drawing towards that. Like right now, do I have any pages? I um, you know, I'm kind of drawing into more Frank Miller Sin City kind of stark black and white, but I know where the colors are gonna go or the shading is to help shape the page. Because sometimes you can get a little lost with just line art, depending on how much detail you're putting in there or how much negative space is is on the page so that you can quote see you know the narrative right but it can get a little in uh ornate and so coloring can sometimes flatten something out and shape something so you know what to look at this is something i just learned just by looking at comics or 
or the fact of just trying to color my own page, you know? Yeah. Well, you definitely pick up that weight there, and uh, there is kind of an emphasis that's placed on the figure work. You know? If you're not adding in so many shades that everything gets kind of lost in that. And I come from that old school of, I mean, as, as bombastic as Jack Kirby was, uh, even down to a conversation was like exploding conversations, you know, like I don't go that far as much as I love looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, but like I still, you know, one would hazard that early 60s Marvel is today's YA kind of style, of, mm -hmm. except for the manga and, you know, some of the other type of artists that draw in a quote simpler way. You know, that would Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, you know, those guys. Um, Will Eisner. I love C.C. Beck. C.C. Beck, the co-creator of Shazam or Captain Marvel, you know, it, it was early influence for me. Um, and then in terms of indie independent guys, like people like Chester Brown, uh, who did Yummy Fur and a whole bunch of other graphic novels, what kind of opened my mind. And obviously Harvey Picard's American Splendor, where he worked with Crumb and a ton of other very alternative outlier artists, you know, uh, and, and I, I, I consume it all because it's all so interesting. There's not, there's no one way to do it. There's no one right way to do it. You just know when something sucks, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and I'm very forgiving about that as well, because as innate as comics is to write and draw, because you just take a pen and a blank piece of paper, you know, break it down in, into squares or whatever the hell, uh, it's actually more difficult than that, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to be honest, you know? So. Yeah. Is there a part of the process where you find yourself slowing down, reconsidering uh, any part of it that's especially challenging or, uh, that kind of makes you reflective? Oh, the hardest part is, is the layouts. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I can write a scene, type a scene and then edit the hell out of it and go back and forth and expand, contract, whatever. It's just typing. It's when you really commit to the what you've written and decide, okay, that's going to be that page or that sequence, right? And then trying to figure out the sequence in comics form and without doing too much of a dance, but also not be boring either, you know? Uh, you want to excite the reader. I want to excite myself to draw it, you know? Uh, <laughs> And so, I mean, I did, I did a lot. It was like working with Picar was like bootleg camp because literally I could have just drawn him talking or standing there talking to someone else most of the time. So I would read his script and go, what is happening in their dialogue that I can cut away to or show something else, a different point of view or whatever, you know? And so drawing a conversation became a little more exciting again because mm -hmm. and I work with Jonathan Ames and I work with other, you know, memoir type comics. A lot of memoir are just navel gazing or talking or you're on a date or, you know, you're pontificating or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I did my autobiography comics, I was lucky to have a kind of life and still have a kind of life where things kind of happen. It gets a little action oriented, you know, like there's danger sometimes, you know, in those stories. And so I can rely on like more superhero mechanics as it were. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it just, it's, it's a sensibility thing. You know, it's what do you want to see? You know, uh, make the comic you want to read. Uh, thinking about chess space and, of course, looking at the title, thinking about that concept, I had an idea of what I was heading into as far as character design. But then when that title character shows up, I was like, OK, there's a little Cronenberg in there, maybe some, some interesting uh, influences, any particular inspiration there behind the, the story you're telling on chess space. It, that's that's a good question because I didn't I don't really remember exactly the origin of chess face. I couldn't remember. I was talking to someone else about this yesterday. I couldn't remember if I came with the name first or the drawing first. I know that I wanted to do some kind of thing analog. When I say the thing, I mean from the Fantastic Four, Ben Grimm, because that's my favorite Marvel character. Yeah. So I was like, how can I come up with my own thing? And then I was like, and then I was like a big fan of Arnim Zola, who's a Captain America villain whose face is on his chest, but it's in a monitor, right? Yeah. So I, I can't remember if he's kind of like a computer robot with a face or if he's organic. I can't remember right now, or maybe both. So I was like, well, that could be a lot of fun. And then, of course, Gossamer from Bugs Bunny, who's that pink, red kind of mo furry monster character, mm -hmm. if you remember. I do you know, know. And, and then there's like, 
a lot of, you know, through history, there have been like characters that have their face on the chest. So I didn't make it up or anything. Right. But I was also like, as, 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 as kind of horrific as the idea is and what I drew, it's, it's hilarious. It's very funny to look at. And every, and every time I showed that drawing, my initial drawings to people, they would laugh and I didn't know who he was. So I was like, well, wait, he's got to be a stand up comedian, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, and if I'm into like the monster romance kind of, tragic you know uh, frankenstein character well then yeah he's trying to be funny but there's a whole backstory of tragedy there right so mm -hmm. he he has been mutated against his will into this thing and was supposed to be trashed and destroyed because it was a mistake but he escaped and so while on the run uh from this evil corporation is trying to like you know er er eradicate him or destroy him you know, take out their garbage, as it were. He's mm -hmm. doing five minute sets at comedy clubs to try to workshop his one hour comedy special. Okay. <laughs> so that's the initial six pages is a little hint at that. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, all right, I got this six page comic that first appeared and debuted in a uh, spider squirrel and trash panda uh, special by uh, Zion studios. Nice. Uh, Charlie McKelvey is, is the uh, publisher and writer and creator of a lot of co-creator of a lot of those characters. And so I really like this universe. I was like, well, I'm going to create a character for your universe. I, I, I mean, it's creator own, but it gets to be in a shared space. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, he was into it. And like, we put it in that comic, the six pages. And I was like, but wait, I want to, I want to tell more about this guy's story. So I, I realized that there was a lot more I could tell, but I wanted to keep the spirit of like the first person narrative that, you know, mm -hmm. it's his voice but it's kind of noir, you know, it's a little Sin City. It's like a little bit like Marv from Sin City, maybe, you know, like uh, he talks in a certain, you know, uh, affect tone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and I just was like, well, let me let me hang out with this guy a little bit longer. And just threw a bunch of other like crazy stuff at him, you know, including yeah. another character. And you'll find out I realized, oh, wait, I can make a funny little superhero commentary, which I won't give away here that I do in the, in the broader 24 page story. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Well, and I love how you, you homage superhero stories that way, but creating on your own also kind of gives you the, the independence, the ability to take your stories in different directions. Like thinking about that sort of anatomical dreamscape scene in uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was a really interesting scene as well in Billy um, and so some of the directions you get to go with some of those creations. I, I, again, like what anchors the stories is the stuff that we can relate to as people, as human beings. And, you know, my, my comic isn't finished until you receive it, you know, like mm -hmm. I can feel like, Oh, I'm done now. But honestly, it's a, it's a communication art. So I'm communicating my work to you and for better or for worse, or whether you like it or not, it ends with you. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. our, our tension, you know, uh, what, what's supposed to happen. But like in doing so, yes, I love genre. I, I love it to death. I love horror. I love superhero. I love romance. I love crime, you know, Western science fiction, which is what superhero comics actually are. It's everything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, where, where however much you use of it depends on, you know, the, the quotients. But at the end of the day, the truth comes from us from our heart and what we've experienced and what we're trying to say. Uh, and it doesn't mean we're going to connect with everybody. Trust me. I get it. Some people could yeah. look at this and be like, Dean, this is ridiculous. I don't care. Like, fine. That's cool. You have a different, you know, interest level or COVID <laughs> cop. When I did COVID cop. It polarized a lot of people, you know, because it's two words people have tough time with, including myself. <laughs> I put them together and I try to tell a story. And again, people have their ideas of what that is going in and they could be right or they're probably wrong. Yeah. You know, and once you read it, it's not like I'm trying to flip the script on you or I'm not trying to be M night Shyamalan, you know, where I'm doing this super twist on you at the end or whatever, but I am trying to provoke and tease you a little yeah. bit mm -hmm. with the comic. And then we get inside. It's like, Oh, there goes Dean again. This is a, <laughs> a kind of a mishmash of stuff. And, you're playing with genre, but where, where's the little love story and what's going to happen? And, you know, and there's only so many times you can do that, which is why I'm not cranking this out on a monthly basis, you know, as much as I would love to, mm -hmm. uh, I can't, you know, and, and that's a whole other business model, you know? Yeah. 
but I, I listen the deep cut you you know the deep comp cuts that I'm doing uh I feel are semi unique and special uh that m probably Marvel and DC and Archie and even webtoon wouldn't publish yeah yeah that's okay yeah, yeah, absolutely. That there's a great space for that, and uh, I think there's an audience that's hungry for it. And as you said, that's the the point. It's that connection between author, artist, and reader. So it's no, and wonderful. and you said a term just now that I got to use. When you said anatomical dreamscape, were you talking about Billy Dogma, the last story, the yes. black and white story? Uh huh. I uh -huh. love that. I love that. I love that. Feel and free. that was Feel weird free. for me because <laughs> it's a mute story. There's no words, right? Yeah. And even I'm not exactly sure what's happening. I'm kind of in putting out these weird ideas, you know, like, which I won't. Well, it's, there's nothing really to spoil because it's just so weird. You know, like <laughs> it starts off. I, I decided to confirm that Trip City, where Billy Dog and Jane Legit live, which is about a four block radius of a small town or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Is it's is it was born birthed from the head of some demigod that it's fell and, and cracked open and spilled out and created a city, which is the very first page, right? This mm -hmm. weird splash page. Mm -hmm. And then you open up to a double page spread, you see Billy Donovan walking toward you naked from Trip City, you know? And then he's walking into the desert and there's these mountains of like female bodies that are all kind of look like Jane Legit or versions of her. Mm -hmm. And then he's like going through all the all of that area to, to come upon his Jane Legit, right? Because what are these ex-girlfriends? Are these versions of her? Like, what is it? I'm not, even I don't know totally. I just knew I had to go with my gut with that one, which is why I didn't put any words into it, you know? And then they have this sexual congress that then has them like laying in the desert, like almost like the same thing as the demigod, you know, in this tizzy, this post-coital kind of uh, orgasmic moment. And mm -hmm. I don't even know where they go from there. Like, what what did they just create? What did they give birth to? I don't know. Maybe there's more to that story. But that also comes yeah. at the end of a 48-page comic book where you've gotten story and you've gotten used to them, where mm -hmm. I can take the liberty to, like, get kind of psychedelic and, and a little nuts, you know, and see what – and just play with, with, with uh, all our expectations of what these characters are. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I love that you don't have – a pinned down narrative there that uh you're sort of open on it because what are those pages are they pining are they imagining what could have been and i i'm now wondering about the universe that's created once they join together at the end of it as well exactly <laughs> exactly well in one of the stories they've broken up for a little while and it sends the city into crazy town where mm -hmm. like i think everyone just gets really horny and needs to have sex because billy and jane aren't <laughs> Or something yeah. like that. So, I don't know. They're 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 goofy, but I also think they're super real. They feel real to me, you know, like mm -hmm. these characters. And 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 it's funny because like one would assume that I'm uh, Billy Dog is an avatar of Dean Hasfield, but really, Billy and Jane, uh, you know, were both sides of the Dean Hasfield coin, as it were. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of your DNA on the page in both yep. areas. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I have a, a creative process question before I ask about what you're currently creating and kickstarting. We, we were talking about music. We were talking about your album approach. And you mentioned that late at night is a generative time for you. So I'm curious, what is, what's on the playlist as you're creating these days? Oh, well, I like old school 1940s to 1960s jazz. Nice. OK, uh -huh. like kind of like two two in the morning type sound like um Oh God, who do I listen to? There's a guy named Ben Webbs. Uh does uh oh God. Uh it, it just it's almost like those they look pretty basic. They're like that, you know, cafe, jazz, lounge kind of music, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also that really boozy horn kind of sound. It's like that's just like dripping with like, you know, um, back alley you know smoky kind of you know what i'm saying like it just yeah. gets it, it, it's it's not um it's not upbeat it's like it's a little slower you know mm -hmm. and it's like this this ominous dreading kind of sound and and with that it means also that i like certain kinds of electronica okay mm -hmm. um, I, I mean i like songs with words clearly you know obviously but sometimes when you're thinking i want to be more like industrial music i really like um 
oh god uh, genesis p orange was in in this band a oh, throbbing gristle there's throbbing gristle um <laughs> There's there's like really eerie kind of horror type music I like, especially when I'm drawing like a chess face or COVID cop or something. Mm -hmm. I, I like kind of like, you know, Moby, who, who's a friend of mine, did a bunch of ambient music that I really like a lot. You know, yeah. um, a lot of the ambient electronic industrial, you know, uh, 40s jazz kind of music. But then I listen to pop music once in a while to get upbeat because, I, you know, you can get too much into your own head. And you're like in a room alone with like one light on. You're like, wait a second, I can switch this up a little bit, you know, <laughs> yeah. just to rejigger, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, like I mentioned, Prince is one of my favorites. I love a, a lot of funk, early hip hop, uh, soul music. I don't listen to a lot of rock and roll. I'm not really, I mean, as much as I respect it, I'm not really a rock and roll guy. So, yeah. sorry. That sounds like a nice eclectic mix. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Al Green. Uh, Curtis Mayfield. So, yeah. Cool. Very cool. Uh, well, you mentioned that you're working on pages. So, I'm curious yeah. about the vision for what's next and, of course, where listeners can go and find out more and support and Let all of those see, wonderful it's things. Visual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's visual. Let me see if I can grab a page. Here's, here's, here's pages later on in the book. And again, in terms of like, this probably won't make any sense to you, but you can see. There's uh, a, a bit. there's some stuff happening here uh, that I know audio people can't understand, but <laughs> I, I introduce a, a couple of characters late late into the story uh, for a very specific reason, mm -hmm. and then here I give another little teaser where you see uh, Chess Face and this character named Meridian Prime nice. uh, busting through a wall, uh, trying to stop this mad scientist from doing more bad things. And, you know, it, it engages, like, kind of, like, base uh, stuff that you want in a story. You know, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with uh, the tropes, right, of, oh, mad scientists in a lab, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, I've never gotten past, you know, the original Frankenstein movie, how that lab looks, you know, like to me, that's what a lab looks like when you want to create life or monsters or whatever the hell you want to do in that room. Mm -hmm. it, and sure, you know, maybe 2001 is, a, uh, you know, 2001 is Space Odyssey, then, at, you know, amped it up with buttons and screens and whatnot. But those are the two sources that I use <laughs> whenever I think about, you know, a mad scientist lab where you might create something like a chess piece. Yeah, you, you gotta have a Tesla coil. You gotta have those things, speakers and and the table, the gurney. I love it. I mean, Jack Kirby drew the hell out of those things. Uh, George mm -hmm. Perez was also great at drawing, kind of like you know, uh, Reed Richards' laboratory and Fantastic Four and that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I I I don't have the full imagination for that stuff, but those guys already laid laid the the groundwork on it. You know, so why not just use what's already been put out there yeah I, I love the science fiction storytelling that way uh for sure for sure and uh for folks that are listening to the audio only version they can go and check out the video on youtube so they can see what we're talking about That's and right. of course get the book <laughs> get the book when it's ready as well oh yeah so right now it's um i'm my goal was for eight thousand dollars mm -hmm. uh but obviously when you do a kickstarter you're you're shooting low so you can get the goal uh and you know that's just the base of me being able to produce the comic and there's some cool tiers that are, that are also available but honestly i'd like to try and double that if possible because i want to pay the writer and the artist and the, and the team uh the four months of work they put into this and that would be absolutely. me yes <laughs> you know, absolutely. Like, that's the publisher pat turning you know uh and talking about like that part of the process. So, you know, nobody put a gun to my head to to make this comic or to make any comic that I personally make. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's it, it is my skill set. I do love making these things, and and hopefully other people like it too. Absolutely. Well, uh, you can count me in. I'm definitely a fan. Glad to feature you, and uh, glad to support, and always glad to have you back on anytime as well as you're creating and uh, whatever the next album happens to be. Well, thanks so much, Jason. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Anytime. Thank you.